Good evening, virtual audience, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Cabot Science Library, I am so excited to welcome you to this event with Hope Jaren presenting her new book, The Story of More, How We Got to Climate Change and Where to Go From Here, in conversation with Barbara Kingsolver. Tonight's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series. We are so excited to continue the work of bringing the authors of recently published science-related literature to our community during these unprecedented times. We have three exciting science book talks planned for this September. To learn about them when they are officially announced, you can sign up for the bookstore's email newsletter at harvard.com, or you can check out the page harvard.com slash events slash science for more info. We also have a science research public lecture series YouTube page where you can see any previous talks that you might have missed. This evening's event is going to conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask Hope or Barbara something, please go to the Q&A chat at the bottom of the screen where you can submit your question. We're going to get through as many as time allows for this evening. Also, once the event begins, I'm going to post a link in the chat to purchase tonight's featured book, The Story of More. All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore, so a huge thank you for your support. Your purchases and your financial contributions, there will also be a donate link in the chat, make this virtual author series possible, and now more than ever, support the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you to our partners at Harvard University, and thank you to all of you for tuning in and showing up for authors, publishers, indie book selling, and especially for science, because it really matters. And finally, as you might have experienced in virtual gatherings these last few weeks, technical issues can arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly. Thank you for your patience and your understanding. So now I am very honored to introduce tonight's speakers. Award-winning geobiologist Hope Jaren has taught, completed research, and built labs at the Georgia Institute of Technology, Johns Hopkins University, the University of Hawaii, and Honolulu, where she was a tenured professor, and now at the University of Oslo, Norway, where she holds the J. Tuzo Wilson Professorship. The author of more than 70 scientific studies and an outspoken critic of sexism in science, she is the only woman to have been awarded both of the Young Investigator Medals given within the Earth Sciences. And if you're watching tonight, it's likely that you've also heard of or read her fantastic best-selling memoir, Lab Girl, praised by the New York Times and Patchett and Barack Obama alike. Hope will be joined on screen tonight by celebrated author Barbara Kingsolver, whose 15 beloved books include Unsheltered, Animal Vegetable Miracle, The Poisonwood Bible, and a new poetry collection, How to Fly, out this September. In 2000, she was awarded the National Humanities Medal, our country's highest honor for service through the arts. Her background, though, is in biology. Before writing, she worked as a scientist, too. And therefore, I can't think of a better pairing for tonight's event, where they'll be discussing Hope's new book, The Story of More, an illuminating book on global warming that takes us on a journey across time and space, outlining thoughts and beliefs from Mesopotamia to Hope's tiny Minnesota hometown. Elizabeth Colbert praises the book, saying, Hope Jaren asks the central question of our time. How can we learn to live on a finite planet? The story of more is thoughtful, informative, and above all, essential. We are so pleased to have them both with us virtually tonight. So without further ado, the digital podium is yours, Hope and Barbara. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really a joy to be here tonight. Um, it's night for me. I'm in uh, Oslo, Norway. Um, it's it's the middle of the night, but it's still light out. Um, next to me on your screen is Barbara Kingsolver. Um, it's it's wonderful to e meet her as I did today, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what she has to say and and what you have to say in in terms of your your questions but mostly what you have to say. Um, <laughs> I am really excited to be here with you, Hope. And I, um, I loved Lab Girl so much that I jumped for joy when um, I got a galley of the story of Moore. And I love the story of Moore. And it's, um, 
as Kate said, it's a, it's a timely book. It's an essential book. It's also a beautifully written book and it's funny, um, which nobody else has managed in a book about climate change. So, um, I'm so, I'm just so happy that this book is in the world and, um, uh, excited to get, um, to get, to help other people know about it. And maybe we could start by, um, uh, hearing from you a little bit about how this book came to be. You say in the first chapter that it grew, the book grew out of a, a class on climate change that you taught for many years under orders from your department chair. It wasn't your idea, evidently, um, but you did it and I'm sure you did it well. I have a feeling this was a wildly popular class because the book is so good. You have to be a great teacher. Um, but that's a big that's a big leap from teaching to writing um i can see how a person would want to make that leap because you have the option of reaching you know instead of 50 people in a classroom you know 50,000 people in the world or something so sure lots of people would like to make that leap but you did it um how did you do it what was your process um what what moved you to do this um you know, it's, I, I always feel, I feel almost guilty for, for admitting it, but I write for really selfish reasons. I write because it gives me a lot of joy to sit at my desk and play with words and try to, you know, there's this thing you want to say and it, it, it exists. It's a formless idea. You know, it's an existential thing. And then you've got this language you know you've got this spattering of words and phrases and stuff you can make up or whatever and and so how do you take the one and as as well as possible embody the other right so it's just like this little puzzle or something that you, that you solve with each phrase or whatever i just and love to sit and do that and spend my days doing that too, right? It's a, you're translating something abstract in your in your mind into into language, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so, and I just love to spend my days that way. I always feel like I'm getting away with something when I get to spend my hours <laughs> that day. So, so I, I write all my books for for all my books, my books for 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 uh, selfish reasons, um, primarily because you know if you if you write something. You don't know if, especially with Lab Girl, you write something, you don't know if it's going to get published. It gets published, you don't, you don't know if anybody's going to buy it. <laughs> if they buy it, you don't know if they're going to read it. If they read it, you don't know if you're going to like it. So you better do it for yourself. You better do it so that you can say, you know, I, I did this. This is something that I had in my life. And so, so, so Lab Girl was really about me making sense of my own life it was a selfish exercise and you know i'd lived all these places and i knew these weird people and i'd done this stuff and figured out some things and none of it really made much sense it was just this weird jumble of stuff and then i wrote it down and all of a sudden it was a my life was a story with a beginning and a middle and you know sort of an end and i i used it to make sense of my life and I thought well if that's what I get out of it that's a lot and then it, it turned out that people wanted to <laughs> read it you know and enjoyed it and and you know things got crazy and then so I decided now, now what you know now now what so I'm a scientist so what does that mean basically all that means is that I've spent a lot of years doing stuff that people in other walks of life haven't Right. So I've walked down this path where I've learned to read papers and I've learned to do experiments and I've learned, you know, how to statistically test outcomes and all this kind of stuff. And people that have walked down the path of being a nurse or becoming a dentist or, or driving a truck of farm equipment, you know, they haven't walked that path. So, so, okay. So I spent 25 years walking that path. What did I get out of it? What, what, what is the most important thing I really have to say to somebody that I got out of this path? You know, this has to mean more than me just keeping busy for, for 25 years on, on this 
you know, on this path or staying on, you know, like managing to stay on the path and not fall off of it or whatever. So the story of more was really about me making sense of my time. Um, it was about making sense of what, what does it mean to be alive on the earth right now? What does my training and the path I've walked tell me particularly about what it means to exist at this particular crossroads in human history? And it also came out the same time I turned 50, right? So that's kind of this nice chunk of time of you know, half century. How have things changed over the decades of my life? What, what, what does it mean for me to have been alive during these decades right now? And that's the question I answered for myself, again, as a selfish exercise. Well, and it, it became I would, the story I would of argue more. That, it, I would argue that it, it was um, an, much more than a selfish exercise. Um, it was a very honest exercise and very helpful to a whole lot of people beyond yourself. Um, there's no subject that's more important for all of us to know more about right now than, than this one that you've covered in the story of more. And um, I'm just gonna say, you may not realize this, but you're a really special scientist. I've spent a lot of time around scientists. When I went to graduate school, most of my professors if you ask them a question, would turn around and answer by writing um, an equation on the blackboard. Um, well and good for the handful of people who know that language. Most of the people in the world don't read that language. And I also discovered in graduate school that there are few people, a very few special people, who could answer those same questions in the English language. And I figured out a couple of things. One is that if you understand a subject really, really well, you can explain, no matter what it is, you can explain it in language, which is something you do. Um, another thing I figured out is that most scientists don't really necessarily want to do that, um, to explain in language that everybody can understand, which is what you do so beautifully. Um, I'm wondering, do you think we have a cultural problem in science? I mean, we're, 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 we've reached this crisis where a lot of people aren't listening to scientists, have just kind of written off science. And it's easy to blame, you know, the, the, the non-listeners. But what, what credit for that problem do we share as scientists, do you think? Um, if we can't talk across the divide, if we can't work hard enough to, to try to make these big concepts more comprehensible. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I've done both, right? So I've, so I've written a lot of papers in this coded language that, you know, you go to grad school to learn and then you become proficient at it. And, you know, you talk about things in, in the third person and you always use the passive tense and all this kind of stuff. And um, I've also written now books with dialogue in them. I mean, that's one reason I wanted to write. I, you, there's certain things you never get to write in science. And number one, you never get to be funny ever. And even if you're a funny person, which I, which, I, which I like to think I am, and you never ever get to write dialogue. Right. So, so there are there are fundamental structural differences in these kinds of writing. But I can say, after having done a fair bit of both, it's much much harder to write for the public than it is to write in the rarefied atmosphere of your own um, expertise. Um, it becomes, you know, there's a formula. You stick to it. You build on what you know. Uh, when you talk about something and explain it and start from a shared place you begin again, you know, you make, <laughs> it's like butter, you have to make it every day because it doesn't keep, <laughs> you know, so you, you start from, if, if you say, I'm going to explain this, and this was one of the challenges I gave myself, I, you know, I'm going to explain this really important thing that has given me so much joy, and has, has, has made me grow as a person that I spent so many hours on, I'm going to share it with you using only words that we both use 
on a daily basis, right? So that's exactly. the challenge is can, is. how much of that can I embody without falling back on this, you know, rarefied code that shortcuts and, and excises, you know, all the joy and all the uncertainty and all, and all the failure and all these kinds of things. Um, what if I, it's, it, you know, it's a challenge to write like that. And it's also, it, you know, and, and you've got a lot of other balls to keep in the air. You've got to keep somebody's interest. You've got to convince them that something so far outside their experience is important. You've got to put them in a place where they're ready to hear something new. Um, you've got to use to, to convince them that you respect them and that you believe that they can understand what you're trying to say. I mean, I look at a lot of science writing and I think that that's the key thing that's really, really missing is uh, respect for the reader. Exactly. Yeah. Res respect and some, some, cat com some empathy, uh, some theory of mind, some empathy for where that uh, where that person is is coming from and what they care about rather than just assuming they they care. Um, I would also uh, ask you, do you find there are costs to, I mean, because we really have two cultures, you know, we have science and we have the arts and very few people cross over, I've found in my life as a person who, you know, as a bat, you know, who's neither bird nor mammal or kind of both. I, I'll just say, for example, when I was um, being interviewed for grad school by a, by a committee, I had my resume and, you know, my, my little resume had some publications and some of them were poems. I had published a few poems when I was, you know, 24 or whatever. And the, the head of my committee said, I see there's some poetry on here. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, there won't be any more of that. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, no, okay. sir. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and, All right. and I would like to think that things have changed since the 80s. But I have a feeling that 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 problem still might exist, that you may be taken less seriously as a scientist or or something or 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 um, there may be uh, wires crossed when you are when you do start to get known for being someone who is communicating well with the public. It's like you're airing the laundry or something. I don't know, do you, do you find that? Yeah, I mean, if people want to write you off, they're gonna write you off um, and they're gonna find a reason Fair why enough. that's the right thing to do. Um, I don't know, I, I think at the root of that, I, science is actually very invested in believing that science is a very hard thing that not everyone can do, right? Um, even as, <laughs> I, and I say that to my colleagues sometimes, it's like, do you really want to live in a world where everybody can do science, right? I mean, so everybody can hum a tune, right? Everybody can sing a song. Is that part of the reason why if you're an aspiring singer and you train at Juilliard and everything like that, you can't expect to make a living wage, uh, working 80 hours a week, right? I mean, so we assign value to different skills. And for whatever reason, um, your scientific training gives you skills that are assigned a very high value. And so there's, there, the science does have a vested interest in, in uh, safeguarding um, access to to that language to that coded language and if everybody understood that stuff would would it be so hard and valuable and necessary and and employable and stuff and yeah. language is the key to sharing it to breaking that yeah, rule sharing it. and the problem with that that notion of exclusivity that I've seen over that I saw in my career as a scientist beginning in the mid 80s and, and, and continuing is that people stopped funding science. And that's, that's the drawback. I mean, in the US funding for especially basic science um, really plummeted. Um, and that's the cost. If you're not willing to let people really know what you're doing and the beauty of what you're doing and the wonder of what you're doing as a scientist, they're not gonna foot the bill. Um, so, so anyway, so I think, I think all, I think all, 
anybody and everybody who can make science more accessible to the broader public is doing us all an enormous public service. And, um, and I think that um, another, another value of what you, of this book and what and and your previous book is that you also make scientists accessible, you sort of you you do a great job of explaining what a scientist really does and is and what what science is, which a lot of people don't even know. Um, so in your in, let's talk about writing, because I think um, you were you, you, I keep thinking about how you were saying you write uh, writing is a selfish act and I'm just not going to let you get away with that. I would say it's an honest act if you write from the the exact point in the universe where you are without thinking too much about who's going to like this. Um, that's a that's probably the most honest and most valuable starting point for a writer because you have something quite specific to say and you'll get there by sticking by uh, by closing the door and not letting other people in the room so i think that it's um i think that it's wonderful and i think some of your writing gifts are um very much very similar to um the tools that that i use as a novelist you use a lot of metaphor and i think you even say in the book at one point um as a teacher, the best way to explain something is to put it is 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 metaphorical. I can't remember exactly how you said it, but if you if you if you make an analogy to something that that students understand, so yeah, you do that beautifully. You use dialogue, and you and your language is so lyrical. Um, I I just I really want people to know how beautiful this book is, and so I'm going to ask you if you would read. Um, this one of my favorite, one of my many favorite passages of the book um, is describing the, the Penthalassa Sea, um, starting on page, the, on page 100. Would you read us that? Yeah. Okay. There was a time, there was a broad and fathomless ocean. Beneath the waves swirled the currents that flushed salt water in magnificent gushes. Deep in the dense, cold darkness, the seafloor waited with perfect patience to embrace the corpse of every living thing above. This was called the Pantalassa Sea, and I am certain that the creatures swimming in it believed their watery world to be the entire universe, extending forever in every direction. The creatures of the Pantalassa were different from the ones that we recognize in our oceans. Jawless fishes writhed in great schools, their wormy bodies streaming behind them as they searched for places to attach. Innumerable cartilage forms swam forever in motion, their gill slits pumping as they moved. Spiral shelled squids jetted back and forth, contracting and squirting their way along. Sea lilies swayed tethered to the bottom by their roots, their animal petals filter feeding on the small and weak that floated by. So beautiful. And this is the story of more. This is where it started because this turns out to be petroleum, where, uh, where we get coal and petroleum and, and gas, and uh, natural gas. And you, you made that really clear in this vivid visual way that I had never really thought about before. I never really, yeah. you know, when you put gas in your car, that's, that's, it's plants, <laughs> it's animals. Yeah. It's animals. Yeah. It's a, it's, um, it's a true, true story. I mean, the, the yeah, yeah. there was this ocean and it's today, um, located. Well, one of these oceans is located where the middle East is now and all this, the live stuff was dead and then it was compressed and now it's the vast oil reserves of the Middle East. Um, the it. fact that oil isn't everywhere is because there weren't oceans everywhere. There were different things. Some places there were forests and those forests are now where we find coal. Yeah, it's so, just, yeah, it's, 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 um, it's beautiful. Um, and another thing I really love about the book is how engaging 
it is. Um, you begin each chapter with uh, some a, a personal story, a story about your family or um, or some event in your childhood or your your best friend when you were six years old, which was a piece of ice named Covington. Um, this is such a great strategy yeah. for a book that's about, let's face it, a lot of stuff that we kind of don't want to hear about. But this is, I mean, it's a trick of the trade. I mean, I, I use it in fiction as well. If you can get the reader on board, you can take them places that they didn't think they wanted to go. And then in the end, they say, oh, wow, I'm glad I went there. And um, you do that by doing this very um, unexpected thing for a scientist, which is you, you're so friendly. You become, you become our friend, which is so valuable because nobody learns anything from being talked at or lectured. We take information, I mean, and, and sociologists have proven this over and over. We accept information from sources we trust. That's it, only. And you become this trustworthy friend in the book. Um, how is it that you are a crackerjack scientist and also able to do this thing where you write in this very um, compassionate and empathetic and friendly way? I mean, maybe that's a weird question, but um, do you have any insights on that that, that you feel are, are uh, relevant to your writing? Um, a lot of it goes back to my father. My father was a um, community college teacher. He taught all the sciences at a rural community college in Minnesota for 42 years, consecutive years. So he taught and taught and taught. And he was always that guy, you know, he was always that teacher. And so when I was little, you know, it was... Uh, he, he, I hung out in his lab and he taught me stuff and stuff like that. And so um, I think picking up that, you know, you learn best when you're in an environment where you feel safe and calm and relaxed and like the person who is telling you something likes you and believes that you're good inside and believes that you're capable of learning whatever it is they're telling you and believes that um, uh, you will get and and is doing it just to share a moment of joy is sharing something joyful with you that they hope will be a joy in your own life you know this very um, he, he, uh, that's what it is to me. And that's, and that's something I learned long before I started going to school and something I kept with me as that's what real science is. That's what real learning is. That's yeah. what real explaining science is. It's, it's a story you tell somebody you really like and you're so proud when they get it you know the only thing better than getting it yourself is when you see that the person you just talked to also gets it yeah. you know it's just yeah. and and yeah. he, he it, gave me that and uh -huh. I I it's it's just it's what I have to give so well I try. it shows it shows and you and you give it very well and I can see that that's that's the same with teaching as with writing uh, the difference, of course, is when you write a book, you don't get to see that moment, you know, of the reader's comprehension. But I always feel like um, the art is only complete. I mean, when I write a book, it's half done. It's finished when someone reads it and gets it. And so, yeah, that, that connection is, is so crucial. Were there, um, so I'm going to say that this I found lots of surprises in this book. There are um, there are there are a lot of data about a lot of things. All of them um, rendered in in interesting ways. I went into this thinking I you know I understood this material pretty well, and there were still so many things that blew me away. Um, just 
stunned me about the story of more, how much we use our patterns of use, our patterns of sort of blowing everything we want uh, into an extra order of magnitude if we possibly can. So I'm going to ask you what, when you were doing this research, what surprised you the most? Well, uh, you know, what the, the, the same numbers kept popping up. I'd say that's the first thing is that, um, you know, and I even put a catechism in the back because once you know numbers, you can really, you can really say something, you know, you're not just in the realm of, of arguing, right? So population has doubled since in I was In your a lifetime. Yeah, in your in 19, since 1969. If you learn yeah. nothing else from the book, you will learn that I was born in 1969. <laughs> population has doubled. But almost everything else has tripled. Food production has tripled. Grain production has tripled. Meat production has tripled. Electricity production has quadrupled. Um, oil usage has tripled. Um, some things are off the charts. Sugar production has quadrupled plastic production has increased by 10 times but this this several times more than this huge population growth which we're generally aware of was outmatched by the production of so many tangible goods and of course services Ooh. right leading and to waste leading to massive price. amounts of waste because it was extremely poorly distributed across this um, configuration, right? So um, that was the other, so, so, so that was something that kept coming up and kept coming up. And I said, you know, this is really the story of the book. It's a story of more, and this is the shape of the more, and this is what I want to communicate. But I think the night that, and I love to sit at my desk and do this, and, you know, even, even static statistics that aren't, you know, very, sunny, you know, uh, mortality rates and stuff like that. I, I, you know, I enjoy looking for patterns in data, et cetera. But there was one night where I was just like, I usually I go home and I keep talking about it. I can't stop talking about it. I go back to my computer or whatever. And there was one night, and this rarely happens, where I just pushed back my chair from my desk and said, you know, I, I'm going to walk home. I'm not going to take the train. I can't, I just, I can't, I can't. And it was the day when I figured out that the amount of food that is wasted within um, the richer countries of the world uh, is calorically equal to the amount of food needed to bring everyone on the globe up from um, undernourished or malnourished to a life-sustaining amount. So the amount that we waste on one side of the planet is enough to uh, feed everyone who suffers uh, on other parts of the planet, right? So, um, so it became very clear to me that you know all of the all of the want and suffering really in the world is due to not the earth's inability to provide but it's because of our inability to share and that's i think that's to me that was a huge moment of learning and and i had to i had to go home and think and say what now you know so so if i say that like that what do you say next what do you say next well what you did say was remarkable. I mean, I think it's one of the most remarkable sentences of the book because you said you, uh, <laughs> me, let me get it exactly right. You're not sure whether to feel more depressed or hopeful about that. That's such a good point because there is so much hope in understanding that we don't have a production problem. We have a distribution problem. And if I can click on my computer and order a pair of shoes or yeah. a coffee maker <laughs> and like 15 minutes later i swear i hear the ups drive you know truck coming up my driveway we can solve a distribution problem um the, some of the some of the most beautiful parts of this book for me were that clarity about 
how soluble these problems are solvable, I guess I should say. These problems really are if we just think outside of our sort of our, our, our hamster wheels of trying and trying to make more and more. Um, and by the end of the book, I mean, about 80% of the book, I think 85% of the book is a, a, is a very lovely story of what is and how we got here. And then the last 10 to 15% of the book is like, what next? What could be done? Um, and what really has to be done pronto, because we're just at this moment when we don't, we, we have to do a lot of things really quickly, but they're very doable. This, I ended, I finished this book feeling really hopeful. Um, even despite all the scary information here, you still sound so, so positive, so hopeful. Can you tell us why that is and how that is? Because we really, really need that right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it also comes from examining the numbers, you know. Um, you know, sometimes within the mechanism of the problem is the process of the solution, right? I, I, I mean, these, these things that are causing all these problems were things that we somehow lived mostly without even 20 years ago, right? So, so it's not, it, so this has happened so fast, it's not inconceivable to imagine a world without them. Um, Right now is, uh, you know, COVID is a terrible disease. We all hate it and wish it had never come, but it's teaching us things, you know, it's teaching us that ugh, we don't all have to be in the same room all the time from all the four corners of the earth in order to transact every interaction and learning and business and whatever, you know, we are learning that a lot of the things we we're so locked into doing traveling and shopping and eating and you know the way we spend our time and our resources those a lot of them turned out to be optional on a very basic level and Such we are now this event that we're having right now while you are in oslo i'm in southwestern virginia and our viewers are everywhere and look it's working i think i hope yeah yeah so, so it's yeah and you you know, I, I, hope is a, hope is something, it's, it's an existential, I don't know if it's a feeling or an attitude or whatever, but I don't know if it can be explained in rational terms. It's not probability. It's not, you know, if you study every night for a semester, the probability you'll get an A is high. Hope is not like that. It doesn't work according to the probabilities. And so trying to explain it in rational terms, trying to argue for it in rational terms is possibly not worth doing. I mean, the best I can explain to it is that I was taught that love is a gift, but hope is a duty. And we, <laughs> if we are able to hope for something, then we are obliged to work for it. I mean, one thing I also say in my book is that, you know, being hopeful requires courage. And um, it takes the most courage to, you know, not criticize institutions or policies and things like that. It, it takes the most courage to, to look at your own life and to take stock of where you use energy, where you don't, what you buy, what you need, how you could be different, how you couldn't be different, how you invest, all those kinds of things. Um, we have to ask ourselves that about our own lives because listen, <laughs> nobody's ever gonna ask on our behalf. You know, I've been a scientist for 25 years. I've worked with environmental scientists calling for policy change, demanding policy change, begging for policy change. I haven't seen any of that policy change. People tell me that your own, your own uh, actions won't make a difference until we have policy change. Well, I'm not ready to wait any longer for these magical policy changes. <laughs> I'm ready to, to look at my own life and to ask you humbly and to give you the tools to look at yours and to tell me what you see. 
because every great change in history has begun at the personal level, whether it was the abolition of slavery or uh, women getting the vote. Um, women didn't wait around to get the vote. <laughs> We'd yeah. still be and you say in your book, I just, I just feel kind of like we can't change it's... policy if we can't change ourselves. And and if if we can change ourselves, we and we can show ourselves and our neighbors and other people. Look, I can have a happy life while using forty percent less energy or something. That spreads, right? That's contagious. It gives it 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 creates more courage. I think. Um, I think yeah. um, the resistance to climate change is very fear driven. And I think personal changes are a good antidote to that fear. Um, and, yeah, and I don't know what the best change for you is. <laughs> you know, if, if I teach you Newtonian mechanics, if I teach you, you know, F equals MA, I don't, I don't know whether you're going to use that knowledge to build a bridge or to build a weapon, right? It's, it's not, I have to trust that if I give you those tools as effectively and as honestly as I can, you will do the soul searching to discover how to make those tools work best for you and to support the things that you love. But my job as a teacher ends after giving you the best information I possibly can because and especially you know I hope this book goes to young people because they they understand the world that they're growing into far better than I do but I do want them to know how we got here and how and how much I respect how much they care and how hard I tried to write it as a story that anybody can have you don't you don't you don't have to take my class you don't have to enroll in the university you don't have to learn this code you you can you can just have it i wrote it down i did my best here it is it's for you i hope you like it you will you will <laughs> i think this is a great great time to open the floor to questions <laughs> Wonderful. I am so happy to turn it over to questions. Um, we've received quite a few. Uh, let's see. Um, I'd like to start with a question from Nell Scoville, who asks... Hi! <laughs> I know, I know. Oh, talk about funny people. People that are funny. Oh, she's, she's professionally funny. She writes, she, she writes for... Do you remember the wonderful, wonderful reboot of the Muppets that came out? Mm -hmm. She writes those jokes. What a wonderful thing. Well, thank you for watching Nell. And she has a question uh, for you both. Uh, this is a great one. Do you think the pandemic has given the world an opportunity to disrupt rampant consumption and remake consumerism? An opportunity, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> undoubtedly. <laughs> what comes next is the question. Like, does it stick? What do you, what do you think, uh, Hope? Yeah, I mean, people are suffering and dying. It's a terrible thing. It's not like there's a, it's not like there's a silver lining or something along those ways. I, I think it has taught us something about the things we thought were necessary that turned out to be optional. I think for the first time in a generation, we slowed down, we stepped back, and we lived without. And, and now we're a people who knows that they can do that if they have to. And I do think that will change everything. I, I, I agree with you. Um, I have read about um, the sacrifices that American people made during World War II, which were enormous. There were no, nobody bought a new car for, for four years or something like that. No, there was no gas, gasoline was rationed, sugar was rationed, butter was rationed. People lived without meat and they turned in their hairpins for the, you know, for the metal drives. And I remember reading all this and thinking, 
those days are over. Americans will never, ever, the Americans I know will never make that kind of sacrifice for the, for, for the public good. And you know what? I was wrong because that's what we're doing. I mean, we feel like we're protecting ourselves, but we're also doing all of it. We're making serious sacrifices, sometimes enormous ones, giving up jobs and childcare and all kinds of really difficult things, doing really hard things, mostly to protect older people, uh, people with, with, um, with fragile health, we're doing and for hospitals to keep hospitals from getting overwhelmed. We're doing this for the for the civic good, and I'm so proud of us. And I'm amazed, and I'm I'm and I'm impressed. And like you, hope I think this means something. We've seen ourselves do something, uh, do something hard. We are capable of continuing to do hard things for the greater good of 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 trying to 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 address climate change there's a related question about the pandemic um given the large amount of data that you've analyzed and have access to have you been able to look at if it's changed over the past few months during the pandemic in other words is it having an effect on the environment yeah right um yeah right so so the so yeah so we've all been living differently and and there are some noticeable effects so so the big one is um if you look at plane travel if you look at the amount of of plane travel that's happened all over the world plane travel is hands down the most fuel inefficient i mean aside from blasting in a rocket ship or something i think in a plane you get you get, it's on the order of feet per gallon, you know, the mileage that you get when you're in a plane. And uh, a couple, a couple months of um, really decreased uh, plane travel was enough to kind of level off uh, PCO2 rise. So the amount of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere was enough to level it off. Um, I think it was, um, March uh, or April, and it was kind of in a month we hadn't seen it before, um, and then it did continue to go up. Um, the The difficult part of of that question, the difficult part of answering that question as well as I'd like to, is that the feedbacks associated with making a change, making that blip, are are long, right? Um, are we going to see? you know, turning the ship around is going to take a lot more than a blip, right? Um, I think, I think there's a lot of glory to be gained from writing those papers. Uh, I think within a year, you're going to see more and more papers published to that effect. Um, you know, what is the, you know, what is the effect on armadillo populations in Texas with less people commuting on the highway and, and splattering them all over the roads, you know, I mean, I, there, there's just so many ricochet effects that are coming off of how we've changed our behavior. Um, A good year for armadillos. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. So, so there, student, uh, scientists see this as a disruption and they see it as an unusual opportunity to measure things. Um, that's not the answer I'd like to give you like a, a like a hard and cold answer about yes this much happened and it's doing this much. Uh, the only one thing I will add to that is that we are in a crisis well in the United States is in a crisis is is that data being collected because the um, institutions like the EPA a lot of the monitoring institutions have suffered um, a great deal of basically dismantling um, a lot of the reports and things that I used to write this book are no longer um, generated, are no longer requested, or um, or uh, uh, assigned under this administration. So we hopefully will be able to figure out, but we do need the consistency of that data collection in order to do it. Um, What do I think? I do think it is the sustained. I do think if we, if COVID-19 causes a new normal, 
and that normal can persist for five years or a decade and it is a different energy usage, I do think we will begin to see um, climate effects of that. But, but just a two month blip, that's a pretty tall order. But the, that's opinion. That was a long answer to a short question. Professor. That's really a good fair. answer though. Yeah. Uh, let's see. This customer asks, this is interesting. What differences do you see in consumerism and consumption living in Oslo? What can Americans learn from them? Do you live in Oslo? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I get a lot of questions about Norway, how Norway has handled COVID, um, how Norway handles everything. Um, the most important thing to remember about Norway is it's 5 million people. So it's a country with a population the size of metropolitan Atlanta. So the things that we do here, it's much easier to motivate and organize 5 million people than it is to um, motivate a much more heterogeneous country, 3 million, 300 million plus that you have in the US, right? But that being said, um, yeah, uh, consumer, <laughs> you know, so, so COVID was this thing and I think we first found out about it somehow March 3rd or so. It seemed like it was in Italy or Denmark. And, and March 12th, we found out at four o'clock the university was closing and we had to be out of there at six and we had to be in our homes. And my kid found out he would not have school the next day that Thursday. I don't remember if it was the day before or day after. We were sent home to our homes and we were told only to go out to um, uh, go to the pharmacy or go to the grocery store. And it was like that for many, many weeks, many weeks. So there was almost no consumption <laughs> during that period. Um, and it really hasn't picked up since then. I don't know if that's exactly what the question was about. Consumption patterns over here, yeah? Yeah. First, probably in general, probably pre-COVID, I pre -COVID. would imagine, people are curious Yeah, about in general, there's, there's less consumption because things are so expensive. I mean, relative to your paycheck, you know, you would never go out and buy a package of 15 pork chops, you know, like, or standardly, you know, you find at Costco or whatever because you know, pork chops are eight bucks each or something like that, right? So the, the cost of things relative to um, your wage is much higher. So you don't acquire as many things, um, but you don't pay for as many services. So you don't pay tuition and you don't pay health insurance and you don't pay, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting way to organize a country. Um, an anonymous attendee says, how do you think that beauty and joy and love as found in both of your books counter climate change fear? I think that fear and guilt can trigger inaction just as often as they can action. So I'm very interested in the positive side of motivation for change. Well, Barbara is, is, a, uh, <laughs> is, a, is a virtuosa at writing about, about love and, and joy and and things like that. So I'm gonna let her take a stab at that one first. Well, I, I was gonna throw it to you because um, <laughs> here we are. Um, because you said something, you wrote in your book that you're, you said my, my, uh, my goal is to in, um, inform and not scare you because teach, something I'm paraphrasing, teaching has taught me to know and respect the difference. Um, I, I so agree with that. Frightening people um, gets us nowhere. Um, I think that um, one, of the, one of the great values of art, of any kind of art, whether it's, whether it's, it's visual art or music, or, uh, but I can speak specifically to fiction, is that we can, um, we can, we can 
en engage with, with a reader, we can gain trust. And as we were saying before, so we can sort of create this common ground. Um, and, and it's just what you were saying, Hope, earlier about teaching. When you create, a, create an environment in a classroom, as your, as your father did, of sort of relaxation and joy and trust, then, then the music starts to happen, the art starts to happen, the science starts to happen, the communication starts to happen. I think um, the real tragedy of the polarized climate of, of my country, of, of where I'm living right now, is that we're all so fixed on being right and the other piece of person being wrong, that any conversation begins with you idiot and then the conversation is over because nobody's gonna listen anymore. And something that we can do through art, and I mean, probably many people, I mean, this translates to many other professions. If we can begin the conversation with um, breaking bread with um, once upon a time, with here, tell me about yourself, with here's something that you and I share, we can go from there into the, the areas where we may not agree, but we may learn from each other. Yeah. But it has to begin, it has to, you have to invite someone in with something good. You don't invite anyone in with a sign on your door that says either, <laughs> this is terrifying or you're really stupid. I mean, nobody's gonna come in the door. I, I, I also think, you know, it, it, this, is, this is the price of admission, right? I mean, every generation is, is, is fated to struggle with the specter of their own Armageddon, right? Or their own annihilation, right? And this is ours. You know, I mean, I, you think of the great plagues of the past that people didn't understand and, and caused so much hardship. And, and you think of how close we came to nuclear annihilation. And you, and you think of, of the looming um, famine associated with the, the population boom of, of the 19, you know, 50s and 60s. And, and there's, you know, there's a component of it that is about keeping the faith, about, about accepting that as part of the, part of the entrance fee to having, to taking a turn on the planet as a person. And that eventually solutions came to all those great ills and it was too late for many people, but it wasn't too late for all. You know, and so um, it's it's uh, we get to be we get to be part of it, and it isn't it's supposed to be easy. I guess I, I you know I'm supposed to be a scientist, but you hear me going back to you know my spiritual position or my existential position or my you know how I view life what is life for what am i for what what am i trying to get out of this and um just like you know the greek gods has to struggle with their insufficiencies and the curses and they brought it on themselves and they tried to avoid it but they couldn't and and yet there was always somebody left at the end of it to tell another set of stories. And I think, I think some of this is, is, is the all part of the pain and the joy that is, comes with the ticket, <laughs> comes, comes with the price of admission. Seeing as it's six here, I think we have time for one more question and maybe some final comments. Um, let's see, I'm gonna go with this one from Rebecca Goguen. 
Uh, as two amazing storytellers, what advice would you give to the rest of us to help shape people's mindset on the distribution problem? How can we encourage people to want to make more of less? And this ties on to what I think you were, you were both saying just now. <laughs> it really does. Um, I think, I think in a, in a sort of consumer and driven society, um, we are, we're, we have in the grain this fear of missing out, fear of not having something that everybody else does. I mean, good Lord, it starts in middle school, right? Um, of not having the thing that will make you happy. And this is just, we're, we're really, we really get brainwashed this way, living in, you know, in, in, a, in a consumer culture. But I think there are beautiful examples um, of, of the reverse of that. And I see them, I mean, I take a lot of, um, of, um, of, of faith and, and strength from my younger friends, my millennial friends, people who have really made a life of, of enjoying and enjoying less rather than more. And I think for me, a great example of this is the local food movement that I have gotten kind of in, deeply embedded in when we figured out that eating locally and eating in season means you're actually eating much better than you know than when you're just being force fed by the industrial pipeline that actually a tomato a, a ripe august tomato is such a happier thing than this horrible thing that you get from the grocery store in January that spent half of its all of its life in the box car. You there it's if you slow down, you know, the slow food movement is is um is a great starting point for how to inspire people with um the beauty of of smaller and slower and uh quality over quantity. And I think that the, um, the pandemic uh, in which we're living right now is a really great opportunity to, to explore this. I think that a lot of people are learning to cook, maybe for the first time, um, having conversations with their children. Um, and again, as Hope said, we're, you know, this is not to say anyone asked for this, but it's an opportunity to understand how, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here in my, in my office, right in my house right now, talking to you and enjoying this forum that I would not have done if I had been required to fly to, to, um, to Boston or to wherever for it. I, I just wouldn't have. So this is, there are great opportunities in retooling and, and um, scaling back. Uh, I think that living, being creative and finding these opportunities and living them and sharing them with our neighbors is, is, a, is a great way to do that. What do you think, Hope? I, I think about, yeah, I, I, well, yes. <laughs> I think about, I was out, I do a lot of gardening because I can't get into my lab and I can't grow plants and kill plants in there. So I'm doing it in my yard. So I was, in my <laughs> so I was in my yard and I've got this thing and it's not really a plant it's not really a bush it's just one of these volunteer things and I'm thinking about digging it up and my neighbor comes over you know I'm dealing with Norwegian vegetation and stuff he comes over he says you know you don't have to dig at that thing all the time you just have to not water it for a few years <laughs> and it'll go and it'll go away right just put a plastic thing on it, make sure it doesn't get any water and go away by itself. And, and so I always think about, you know, money is like that. You know, you're, you're watering things when you spend money. So if you want something to go away, you can just kind of stop watering it. Right. And I, I tell that to my students a lot because, you know, they don't, they don't have a lot of money or whatever, but they walk, they walk around and they buy, you know, a latte, they buy stuff on the street, they whatever. And, and, um, the, the, 
you know, which place are you going to buy the latte at? Which, which, you know, what can you find out how they treat their employees? Can you, you know, these kinds of things. And I try to instill into them that these are choices like you make th that your consumption is actually the sum total of hundreds of little choices that you make all day. And that the first part of knowing where the big changes are is to kind of take stock of where all your small transactions are going. You know, um, and that's, and that's what I like to talk about. I don't, I don't want to tell people what to buy or not buy or eat or not eat or, you know, this kind of thing. But um, if you stop, like, but if it, there's just something to that and I haven't quite figured it out yet, but if you don't, sometimes all you have to do is just not water it and it'll die. It, it'll stop growing. You don't have to dig it out. You just have to stop watering it. <laughs> Does money work that way? Absolutely. Well, I think that's all the time we have, but I think that's a great ending note for this conversation. Um, I would like to thank you both so much for being here in the virtual cyberspace and for having this wonderful conversation tonight. Um, thank you for all of you out there who are attending. It looks like there's 350 of you at least. Um, feel free to learn more about this important book and purchase the story of more on harvard.com. Seen right there. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science and the Cabot Science Library, all here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Have a wonderful night. Please keep reading and please be well. Thank you, everyone. Bye.